happy to be back. Happy to be back in the big room. Hey, everybody. It's 7 o'clock. It's great to have you back with me at Studio A on a Tuesday night. It feels a little bit later in the week, to be honest, but don't worry. It'll be later in the week before you know it. But it's Tuesday for now. It is the 9th of April. Happy birthday to everybody who was born on April 9th. Happy birthday to you. April 9th, 2024, 7 p.m. on the nose. Now it's 7.01. Uh, tonight, we've recovered a little bit more time uh, from what is usually a band practice shortened evening. But my good buddy and bassist, uh, Derek, was stuck in Canada slash Niagara Falls region because they went up there to see the the eclipse and was not able to get back. So what the hell? I didn't know that you were leaving town to go see the eclipse, but good for you. They had a nice little time, uh, but they weren't able to get in. So instead of stopping at 8, 30, uh, 8 o'clock tonight, we're going to stop somewhere around 8.30 um, because I had already uh, committed to to using this kind of light preparation day with a half of a show there with no guests and anything like that. I was already really committed to using this to clear my plate of a lot of other things that were building up, uh, you know, writing new scripts for different uh, videos and, and other things like that. So uh, we got some time and I want to take some calls in that time. I have some mixed uh, mixed berry stories that kind of have come in. One about Jerome Arizona that I wanted to do last night, but there was no time for that. Great show last night. Had a lot of time with Jeff, a lot of uh, fun with Jeff Harmon, and then, and then uh, book club was just fantastic. Join the book club. That that just that all that means is just become a sponsor of the show at any tier. It doesn't matter, but it just it's book club. And of course, starting maybe next week, if not next week, then the week afterwards. But people who are our uh, monthly sponsors are also going to get the not only do they get the the Sunday stream links sent to you and the book club links sent to you all this extra uh, exclusive stuff but also now we're going to be able to and we're going to provide you guys with uh, exclusive links to just peek in on band practice as long as like we're running through set uh, you know, if we're piecing together a song or if we're doing something tedious, maybe some nights you can watch how the sausage is made. But other than that, um, more and more reason to become a sponsor, trying to create value on top of value. And you guys, in return, give me the ability to grow this show to new production heights. So there's that. Let's see. Um, thank you all for being here. So that's really what I have. Oh, NPR. I, it really was our, our friend Shem, Shem Infinite, he put together a thread on this today that I thought was really good. And I had already seen the article and I just think it's just so fascinating. It's nothing, it's not surprising, but it's written by a guy. What is his name? Uh, Yuri Berliner. It was published today. The headline is, I've been at NPR for 25 years. Here's how we lost America's trust. Uh, number one, 25 years there. A lot has happened in 20, a lot has happened in five years, but still the, some of the things that he talks about, it's just so incredible. It's just so incredible, especially somebody who's there for that long to see that transformation, that really werewolf at, at, at uh, you know, on a full moon kind of a transformation is just nuts. Uh, aside from the fact that NPR, every, every dollar has to be pulled away from them. Never should have been given. Just like this. Just like this. Headline from Front Page Mag. But it's being covered all over the place. That Joe Biden character, he's out there, again, trying to buy buy votes, bribe people by talking about things like student loan forgiveness. Biden offers $300 billion bribe to buy 30 million votes. That's what it is. That's what it is. You see, the thing is that when both sides, both sides of the scam, the Republican side, Democrat side, are all there for centralized control over whatever, and the central planning, these big programs, whatever, uh, 
ed Department of Education to be, even exist. The fact that these things are just bygone conclusions, they're all in agreement that they're, they're, they're perfectly uh, constitutional and they should exist. Then, then really it's just a matter of playing hot potato. Who's going to be able to then forgive debt? To forgive debt that should have never been issued in the first place. After $138 billion in bribes already, Biden visits Wisconsin to promise student loan debt transfer from his potential voters to taxpayers who are already facing $100,000 in debt per household from the national debt. You can go to usdebtclock.com and see that tick upward in real time. It's crazy to be a newborn baby and already have like $75,000 worth of debt. That's, um, I'm telling you, they all should be strung up. While student loan debt transfer loaded onto taxpayers is bad enough, Biden is fairly blatant about making it a bribe by doing it in a battleground state as a part of his election campaign. So he's out there doing this. What's the cost of this particular bribe? What is the cost, they say? Biden isn't saying, but the last time he tried this and was shut down by the Supreme Court, the cost was estimated at $430 billion for 40 million potential Biden voters. This time around, the Biden administration is claiming that it's bailing out 30 million potential voters. That may mean around $300 billion. And I like how they, they stay firm on saying potential voters, because that's all this is. That's all this is. It's, um... It's just what you got to take. It's back, back, the back and forth. This is the back end of the initial swindle. First, you break the law. You buy the votes by guaranteeing a college experience for people who largely don't belong in college. Largely do not belong there. And then, before you know it, there comes a time when we are left with what it seems to be an infinite amount of overeducated children who have delayed adulthood, they have very few useful skills. Their degrees are completely meaningless. Uh, and they're smothered in debt. And they're taking plenty of jobs that are is outside the bounds of everything that they've been studying for six to eight years. And that's when the same felons, they wear all different color ties. That's when the same felons from before, they come back to the scene of the initial crime and then they start saying student loan forgiveness is what we need to do in exchange for your votes. And uh, after each phase, we become sicker, far more poor, destined. They want everybody. They want every phase of a person's life to run parallel to massive government dependency programs. Or I guess I should say the other way around. They want massive government dependency programs to run parallel to every phase of a person's life from education, child care, health care, retirement, and then soon euthanasia. Euthanasia. That's where it's all going. Horrible people. Really horrible. And what do we get from the education, too? What do we get from the education? We get Sonny Hostin. We get Sonny Hostin and all of her cheesecake, cheesecake eating hag friends on The View. Sonny Hostin claims the eclipse caused by climate change. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love it. You gotta love it when people are stupid and you can sit back and laugh at them. The View co-host Sonny Hall. I'm, I'm feeling a little salty tonight, ladies and gentlemen. All right. And for those of you who are like, Frank, are you going to do uh, Rude Tuesday? Are you going to are you going to introduce Rude Tuesday? We're going to take it on a pilot run tonight? No. No. Can't do it on a night that I'm actually feeling extra, extra irritable. Probably next Tuesday, we'll 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 try. Uh, we're going to try something new. It's going to be Rude Tuesday. The View co-host Sonny Holston blamed Monday's solar eclipse, Friday's earthquake, and the expected cicada breeding season on climate change. Well, of course, all those things together would maybe lead to one believe that either climate change exists or something is really going on. She said on Monday, all of those things together. A 4.8 magnitude earthquake was felt across New York and New Jersey on Friday. On Monday, the highly anticipated solar eclipse. Uh, Halston, who claimed that her studio makeup artist put on her coat and ran down the hallway during the earthquake, saying, Jesus is coming. The rapture is here. But co-hosts Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg 
had to reel her back in. That's when you know it's it's uh, it's bad. Uh, except earthquakes are not at the mercy of climate change. It's an under it's underground. It can't said Behar, which I don't even know if it's if that's totally true. Uh, as far as climate change, I, I don't know. But as far as it's if it's just if you talk to Ben Davidson, he'd say that it's not a purely underground phenomenon. That there is a way for outside forces to influence uh, tectonic movement. Um, but how about the warming of the planet? She responded. And let's just take for for a moment. Let's just, I just want to look at her. I want everybody just to look at her face. Just look. And think about what she said. You looking at her face? Look at her eyes. Look at her cheekbones. Now just think about all the stupid shit she said. And then remember that The central processing unit that came up with those stupid, stupid, stupid thoughts was behind those eyes. What is this? What am I looking at? There you go. I just want I want everybody to just look at her for a second. And there you have it. There's um, a little bit of our wonderful education system at work. Hey, but hey, uh, feel delight. Be hopeful. She works in television. So I'm glad everybody was just give it a chance. All right. Here's another one for you. Uh, Another one that um, I don't know if the public school system failed her or if she just never had a chance. This is Sheila Jackson Lee uh, from Texas. Here Sheila Jackson Lee is saying that the moon is made up of mostly gases. Um, So here you can just uh, come in from her mouth from the horse's mouth. And sometimes you've heard the word full moon. Sometimes you need to take the opportunity just to come out and see a full moon is that complete rounded circle, which is made up mostly of gases. <laughs> and that's why the question, the question is why or how could we as humans live on the moon? Are the gases such that we could do that? <laughs> the sun is a mighty powerful heat. It is almost impossible to go near the sun. The moon is more manageable. And you will see uh, in a moment, or not a moment, you'll see in a couple of years that NASA is going back to the moon. <laughs> I hate them. Yes. And in a moment, in a mo- I, I, I was waiting for her, her podium to blast off. In a moment, I will be going back to the moon, back to my my favorite gas planet. Oh, it's I don't think that's AI. I don't think that's AI. I think that is just. But then again, Sheila Jackson Lee's a dummy, dumb dumb, dumb dumb. Speaking of dumb dumb, we have another dumb dumb from Texas. Her name is Representative Jasmine Crockett, and uh, here she is. Speaking with uh, somebody who thinks that she's smart, I guess, waiting there with her microphone, interviewing her, waiting for some nuggets of just brilliance, waiting with bated breath. And uh, here she is talking about the reparations, a really great idea someone, a celebrity had brought up about reparations, because, of course, this is this is really the test of the test of our time for people like Jasmine Crockett over here. They, it's not about going out there and finding a purpose and it's not about finding a job, being productive and taking complete control over your life and really wanting to shut the world out and try to keep as as little involvement from the outside world in your personal life as possible, where you want to actually just cut the umbilical cord and show everybody what a shining rocket of a light you are in the world. Instead... All that stuff is ableist. That's all ableist. We've even suffered a we have we have suffered at least uh, someone like Jasmine thinks this suffered an incredible injustice hundreds of years ago. I don't know any of the people involved, uh, of course, but um, but I think that this is um, we're stupid enough and we are coercive enough a society at this point to actually maybe get some cold hard cash out of this for doing nothing. 
And I think that the real thing that they do at this point is try to find a way of making that deadbeat reparations argument in ways that actually sound philosophically sound and intelligent. Like, how do we sound, how do we make sounding and asking, asking for things like this, how do we make being a deadbeat sound intelligent? Listen to Jasmine Crockett try to put it all together. You can see, you can already see from that, uh, that, that, that screenshot right there. The, the wheels are turning. She's really, really trying to, um, trying to get the engine revving there. Just this past week I saw, I don't remember which celebrity, but it was actually a celebrity and I was like, I don't know that that's not necessarily a bad idea, but I'd have to think through it a lot. One of the things that they propose is black folk not have to pay taxes for a certain amount of time because then again, that puts money back in your pocket, but at the same time, it may not be as objectionable to some people about actually giving out dollars. I know because it's a lot more, because remember, giving out dollars requires you to only do one thing. Hold out your hand, you know, um, I, even though even though we're talking about when, when you talk about removing, getting in, eliminating taxation, especially on a federal level. And letting people vote on local level, what you want your local government to uh, tax you on and what you want provided for you on a local level where you actually do get a little bit of bang for your buck. I love living in my town where. We pay taxes and they pick up our garbage on Monday and Thursday mornings and our trash and our and our lawn refuse every every Wednesday. I, li I, I like that. And if I didn't like it, I can move to the one town over where there is no taxes for that. And you instead have to bring your stuff down to the dump yourself or you can go and uh, you can go and. Um, strike up a business relationship with any number of carding companies that are in the area that are always competing with each other to provide the best price for the best possible service. You see how all this all works? Uh, that, that's the kind of thing that we should always be fine focused on and listening to people like Jasmine Crockett on the federal level doing things, even if it's just a hypothetical and they're small bird brains with money that they should never ever even feel comfortable suggesting they could touch oh man man oh man and the fact that she got this idea from a celebrity doesn't even know what celebrity it is maybe she does it's probably like carrot top or something carrot top's still alive yeah let's eliminate eliminate taxes for black folk just for a while well listen listen i think uh, taxes should be eliminated for everybody then again that that would only benefit people who are working OK, now not to say that I, not, I'm not I'm definitely not saying that all black people in this country are not working and they're on the dole. No, but but you do something like that. You can't be on the you can't be on the dole for any of this black, white. This is why I'm saying these these hypotheticals. They wanted to make it seem like. You get into government and you are dealing with radioactive materials and it's a sign you have to go to school. You have to be prepared to go in to do the scientific work. Every idea creates 10,000 other problems which would need a whole other committee of people to manage the individual problems and the unforeseen consequences of this shit. I mean, this is just, it's not, oh God, I wanted to just collapse already. I don't even want to hear this anymore. I would rather this dumb nonsense be taking place wherever the hell she's from in Texas. I, I'd rather that conversation be had there where she is shut down soundly, soundly. But obviously then you start dealing with the different tax brackets and things like that. And that's one. Yeah, an another thing that is completely egregious reasons that you know we argue the reparations make sense because so many black folk not only do you owe for the labor that was stolen and killed and all the other things right yeah, don't kill our labor but the fact is like we end up being so far behind right and so it's like how do you bring you every time you open your mouth every time you open your mouth the people you represent because, of course, there are plenty of black Americans who will listen to this upchuck and will say, oh, 
just shut your mouth and get a job. But every time she opens her mouth, the people who think that she's worthy of listening to, they are dragged back 50 years. They're dragged back. This is like hamster wheel nightmare talk. For us people, yeah. exactly. And so it's like <laughs> if you if you do the no tax thing, for people that are already say struggling and aren't really paying taxes in the first place, <laughs> it doesn't really <laughs> exactly. Right, right, right. For people who are already tax exempt, for people who are already tax exempt and largely living off of the involuntary taking from other people's fortunes, no matter how small that hill of beans may be. They're all, you know, they're, they, the reparation should feel like you're, you're getting on top, you know? So we, we need this to be a privilege on top of a privilege and on top of a, on top of a, a, a safety net that was built on top of a safety net, on top of a cushion, on top of a mattress, on top of a safety net. Yeah, it's just, whoa! <laughs> oh my God. Clown! What a clown! Is sitting there on their, uh, on their, uh, their, their, their seat. Ugh! Was that a real conversation? Were those? Was that real? Was that AI? Oh, you know who loves the idea though? Crazy shit lib boomer women. This, I mean, maybe you've seen this pic, this this video. This is just is this almost triggers me. Because I can't tell you, I can't, this reminds me of a couple of Christmas parties I've been to over the last 10 years, and I feel, I feel nausea, I feel pity, and I also feel a, 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 a strange sense of fascination as if I had gone into one of those, you know, the Bronx Zoo, and I'm just observing a, a, a very, I don't know, like, it, not a sick species, but just something strange about this. Here they are. Um, I mean, just just get a look at the lo of the room here. Oh yeah, everybody, Pennsylvania! Yeah. We're in the house. Woo -hoo. Mm. Cross town traffic. Yeah. There's nothing worse than shit lib boomer uh, white people. There's nothing worse. Nothing worse. Pennsylvania, you have to get out and register to vote. And you have to vote, vote. for Biden Harris. No one has ever told this bitch to shut up in her life. Ever. And look at look at this slave in the back. This poor this guy has this guy has been asking to go to the bathroom for the last 37 years. This guy has not in 37 years, this guy in the back. Not once has he gone to the bathroom without asking. First, not once. Is that other guy, the orange man? The orange man, like this? Like he what? You're wearing a salmon-colored whatever the hell that is. You weird. Ugh. Ugh. Got some E. Jean Carroll vibes right there. Oh, I can't even. Her sex toys, they probably have uh, the gas-powered. Gas-powered. Whatever the hell she's keeping under her bed is gas-powered. No doubt about it. And even that, even that, it's not enough. Even that's not enough. Blowing a gasket. He is going to take away your social security and a lot of you are... No, right. he's a bad guy. I need my social security. No, he's not. I need my social security. <laughs> I told you. I told you. Vote bribing. I mean, they've lost their minds a long time ago. But there you have it. Education, child care, health care, retirement, and then euthanasia. Euthanasia. That's the next. Don't worry. Don't worry. She'll be booking herself a pod in the gas chamber soon. You know, I'm 77. But just want to die. Right. Don't take and away he's going to take away your health care. Oh. Because kids right now, until they're 26, can be on their parents' Healthcare, and the orange man wants to stop that. Woo! Oh, no. Fucking kill me. Oh, my God. Why? 
Just... Please. Kill me. I know. I know. It's getting that. It's getting like that. Just do it already. All right. 725. 725. We're going to come back and we're going to have a little... We're going to just do a little reading. We're going to take a little calls. We'll see what the hell else happens. And, um, and that'll be our Tuesday. So... You know, I saw something on, I don't know, it was on like one of those studyfinds.org websites, but not study finds. And it was talking about how therapeutic writing an angry letter and then ripping it up is, which is like, again, you, was there money put behind this? I mean, that's something that we used to do in like summer camp. Write a letter to somebody, or if you go, you know, count, you're getting counseled by someone, write a letter to try to help bring yourself to closure. Don't mail it, whatever the hell it is. Why are we still studying shit like this? Anyway, why did I bring it up? Because that's essentially what this show is for me and always has been. Only thing is that I, if I write, the, <laughs> I'm writing the letter, but I'm sending it. I'm also sending it. So I don't know if that's therapeutic. Or that just exposes me to something else. Anyway, we'll be right back. Did you wash your ass today? You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? Let's ride! Vagina. Yes. Welcome. Woo-hoo-hoo. All right. Now, the first thing, first thing I wanted to do. For, by the way, I just saw in the the collective chat room that there was a couple of people on the uh, the X slash Twitter chat. I guess the first time I've seen that integrated into um, into Restream, and it's read-only now, but I just wanted to tell everybody that's watching on Twitter for the time that we're on there before we kick off um, toward the, uh, the website at uh, intermission. I see you. I cannot talk back, though, and I try my best to keep up with the, the chat rooms, but mostly you guys just tend to yourselves. And I'll do what I have over here, and then hopefully you'll call in when the lines are open, or you'll send me a super chat. You can do that right now. Here it is, quite frankly, superchat.com, or I've got you a nice little uh, QR code. I don't know. It's all whatever. There's the there's the super chat. Tell me what the hell you think. Uh, I'll tell you. I had a little bit of... Uh, oh, here's another thing I got for you. What the hell? I started watching Mr. Rogers again because, you know, Aurora was just looking for new things to watch. And so, you know, I'm going to show you some Mr. Rogers. Because there's some... I used to love Mr. Rogers, especially like when he goes to a, a pretzel factory or he, he takes, you know, the audience into a plane. You can see what the a pilot does in the plane and what the, the, the stewardess does in the plane and all that shit. And it was just really great. But I'll tell you, I is everybody on Mr. Rogers divorced? Is everybody is divorced. Now, I and I understand that was part of 
the allure there and, and, and what he really did for a lot of kids, especially in the 70s and stuff when people are a lot more people are getting divorced and that was still very taboo and it's hard for kids to deal with, even hard for kids to deal with today. Uh, even though a lot of kids are just born and the parents were never married in the first place. So I guess it was just uh, a given. But, um, you know, it's just like there was episodes where divorce had nothing to do with the main theme of the day. And all of a sudden this this adult will show up and talk to one of the puppets and just like, hey, what's going on? Oh, I'm just sad. Cause it's gonna be blah, 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 blah. And he's like, well, I'm divorced. So I, I, damn. Damn. I thought they were talking about divorce the last episode, and it was. So I was, I was like, oh, great. I don't want to have to have these talks with Aurora at, at three, especially if she thinks, you know, what does that mean? Do everybody, does mommy, is every mommy and daddy going to get a divorce? So that's just something that I've never watched Mr. Rogers as an adult before. And uh, I'm just wondering, did I miss this? I guess I did. Everybody is divorced in Mr. Rogers. Every puppet is divorced. Um, so there's that. All right. Well, thank you so much for letting me talk about that. The first one up, I want to start with a, a strange travel story that we were discussing on uh, last Thursday. Whenever my cousin came in, last Thursday. And here it is. Out of all the strange, weird travel stories, strange towns along the way, uh, we had a couple of people comment on a Jerome, Arizona. Jerome, Arizona. I think Rosie called in to talk about Jerome, and then I started getting emails about Jerome, uh, especially about this whole thing here. And I went and I confirmed it, although I need more on it. Uh, in the old days in Jerome, the dead of this town were all cremated and their ashes were mixed into the concrete that was then used to pour the very streets and sidewalks on this mountain village. So several websites I went to, including uh, exemplar.com, they mirrored that whole did you know factoid about Jerome, Arizona that many of the towns dead from at least one era were mixed into the concrete that made all the streets and sidewalks. That's one thing. Then I got a couple of emails, but this one took the cake. And I'll, uh, I'll keep her name zipped up. Let's see. Um, way back when, my cousin... My cousin gifted me a long weekend with her and her new husband in Jerome. He thought that he was a pirate. Her cousin's husband thought that he was a pirate. That's a, another story altogether, but he was very insane. He said he was tired from our travels and wanted to rest in their room, so we went out shopping, and when I came back, I found somebody had been in my room and left a little mess on my silk chair. Oh. Oh. That kind of mess? Now, my silk chair that were still wet and my coat was there. Ugh. I didn't even see that part. Sorry. Turns out the very wicked bed and breakfast owner, who I believe was a witch. And remember, this was what Rosie was talking about, uh, going into some kind of a record store, music. I, I don't know what it was. It was a store, and the person there was uh, bewitched themselves. So much so that Rosie and her husband not only left as quickly as they could, but they did not want to leave. They didn't want to leave town before they went to a church to get, uh, well, you know, holy water splashed on them or something. Uh, or so he says the bed and breakfast owner was be uh, was bewitched uh, in my room on my chair. He claims that she gave him some very strong alcohol. Wait, what? Turns out the very wicked bed and bre bre breakfast owner, who I believe was a witch, bewitched him. Oh, bewitched the pirate. Or so he says he was bewitched by the bed and breakfast owner. So in my room on my chair, he claims that she gave him some very strong alcohol and told him he would be really happy if they did it in my room. He says he was drugged. He said he was drugged and he had to have some kind of coitus with the B&B &B owner who bewitched him. Apparently, she likes pirates and turns out that he had a very creepy sexual addiction. The town is very weird. 
So the town is very weird. It does have a very strange vibe. It's beautifully situated in a lovely landscape. A mountain desert high up with the beautiful painted rocks, and you can see very, very far away. At that time, there was a lot of forest fires going on, and you can see the smoke for a very long ways away. Jerome is an old frontier mining town. I don't think it's haunted, run down in a funky sort of way, but a lot of crazy-ass people go there and try hard to make it seem like it is haunted. It's very quirky. A lot of musicians and artists... We'll never forget that place. My cousin and this guy fought the entire weekend after that. It was a terrible weekend. He came after me in her kitchen when we got home, and she blamed me for it many years, for many years, and wouldn't speak to me. She was so humiliated by uh, by what had happened. And she finally got rid of him, but it cost her a fortune. Beware of pirates. Well, I guess that's not... Totally the problem of the town, although if he the pirate the pirate was telling this the truth about um about the bed and breakfast owner bewitching him then then that's something that's something to investigate that was years ago. maybe she'll go back and give us a little bit of an update of what's going on there all right, so there's something I wanted to throw out into the um to you guys. You do with it what you want. And that's that. Now, NPR, I want to do this real quick. Something else indeed. Here's what our buddy Shem had said. This article is incredible, and I agree with him. It's, I've been at NPR for 25 years. Here's how we lost America's trust. Now, what he does is, at first, he opens up and he talks about how long he's been there, the, the splits in the readership how for a long time it was always leaning left but it enjoyed a really really balanced readership something like uh you know close to 30 percent or 25 percent conservative there was another third that was pretty independent and then there was about 37 percent that said that they were liberal and it, it, they had maintained that for a while but by 2023 he said the comp- The picture was completely different. Only 11% describe themselves as very or somewhat conservative. 21% as middle of the road and 67% of the listeners said that they were very or somewhat liberal. We weren't just losing conservatives. We were also losing moderates and traditional liberals. Now, here's the other thing. He starts going into all the things he started noticing. And it starts with Donald Trump and the whole Russia thing, especially hitching their wagon to the Adam Schiff uh, circus. Uh, Persistent rumors that Trump campaign colluded with Russia over the election became the catnip that drove reporting. At NPR, we hitched our wagon to Trump's most visible antagonist, Representative Adam Schiff. Schiff was the top Democrat in the House Intelligence Committee, became NPR's guiding hand, its ever-present muse. By my count, NPR hosts interviewed Schiff 25 times about Trump and Russia. During many of those conversations, Schiff alluded to uh, purported evidence of collusion. The, sh- uh, the shift talking points became the drumbeat of NB- NPR news reports. That's all we heard. That's all we heard. Purported evidence of con- collusion. It was dynamite. We have it. We have it. We have it. No, con- There's no, no consequences. We stopped expecting those a long time ago. Now we just kind of understand what we're going, what we're living with and what we have to find some way we have to, some way, we have to find a way out of it. Schiff, who was a top Democrat, we talked about that. But when the Mueller report found no credible evidence of collusion, NPR's coverage was notably sparse. Russiagate quietly faded from our programming. And that's the way it always goes down. It just fades away. Fades away. What's worse is to pretend that it never happened, to move on with no mea culpas, no self-reflection, nothing. Now, with something like Russia, they can kind of they can do that a lot easier than than COVID. When COVID, you're destroying children's, you know, childhood, their education, their development. You're you're breaking apart families. You're thrusting people into addiction. Their suicide rates are through the roof. You're you're uh, you're pushing all of these non-scientific Uh, social distancing notions that do nothing, that did nothing but actually make the situation worse. And then you hitched your wagon 
to a medical abomination. And even that only had weakest of mea culpas that, oh, we, we only had the best in mind. Let's just, let's just remind ourselves of this going forward. No, actually, no, no, this deserves more than jail time, to be honest. More than jail time, but I'm just one man, one man alone on my island with an opinion. That's all. Russiagate was not NPR's only miscue. In October of 2020, listen to this. The New York Post published the explosive report about the laptop the Hunter Biden, uh, Hunter Biden abandoned at a Delaware computer shop containing emails about his sordid business dealings. With the election only weeks away, NPR turned a blind eye. Here's how NPR's managing editor for news at the time explained the thinking. Here's a quote. We don't want to waste our time on stories that are not really stories, and we don't want to waste the listeners' and readers' time on stories that are just pure distractions. It's just so rich by 2020 when you've already done all of that water carrying for the shifts with uh, Russia and even at that point the Ukraine call in 2019, and it's just uh, it's, it's tremendous, but it wasn't pure distraction or a product of Russian disinformation, as dozens of former and current intelligence officials suggested. The laptop did belong to Hunter Biden. Its contents revealed its, co its connection to the corrupt world of multi-million dollar influence peddling and its possible implications for his father. Bonafide implications for his father. You see that they just gave the woman who f had the Ashley Biden diary and, uh, and, and gave it away, sold it or whatever. They just gave her a, a month a month, that's it. Punish, punish that bastard. Everybody, never mind that in the Ashley, uh, Ashley Biden diary, she talks about inappropriate touching and inappropriate showers with her old codger father. It's just, um, it's just, just tremendous. Tremendous what you can do when you control the eye of Sauron, when you can just shift the focus of what a story really is. And um, and all of your orcs, your orc army will go to war for you and just knee-jerk programming, go to war. That's it. And uh, and then you're just, you're just fighting yourself out of a bar fight. It's just a barroom brawl at that point. There's uh, no chance of, of justice because you're just trying to keep your head above water. And at that point, you start realizing what the hell's the point? What is the point? Okay, let's see. Now the lag. Then we have the COVID COVID coverage, most notably the reporting on the origin of the pandemic, one of the most dismal aspects of COVID. They're talking about the lab leak theory and all that stuff. But here's something that I, I wanted to jump down to, down toward the end. There's an unspoken consensus about the stories we should pursue and how they should be framed. It's frictionless. One story after another about instances of supposed racism, transphobia, signs of the climate apocalypse, Israel doing something bad, and the dire threat of Republican policies. It's almost like an assembly line. And this is just NPR, by the way. The mindset prevails. You know, if this was anything else, they, they'll go and NPR, they go into it. They're, they're losing viewership. They've had to cancel a bunch of podcasts. No, far few people. Uh, far fewer people are listening to and, and consuming their shit, but they are an assembly line product. There's no life to it. It is just performing a zombie like function for a dying state and it's funded by the state. You know, at least these other commie rags. They're shutting down their doors. They're 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 shuttering their windows. They're laying people off. Of course, that is unless uh, they are vice or something else that has a, a recognizable brand name that George Soros wants to gobble up and keep alive like a zombie body that NPR is with with uh, federal money. That's just really what it is. If this was a free market, we win the day. And that's why it's just like. Whenever the hell that day happens. It's going to be, it'll be sweet. Now, will we be using the internet? I don't know. I don't know. But that's what I'm just saying. In the free market of information, we win the day. They don't exist unless they have these ICU units of funding propping them up. They're bloated, rotting bodies 
of brands that at once had some sort of legitimacy, uh, a, a little bit more integrity. He goes on, though. Listen to this. The mindset prevail, prevails in choices about language in a document called NPR Transgender Coverage Guidance disseminated by news management, we are asked to avoid the term biological sex. Avoid the term biological sex in your writing. The editorial guidance was prepared with the help of a former staffer of the National Center for Transgender Equality. (laughs) The mindset animates bizarre stories on the beetles and bird names that are racially problematic. We were talking about that. That was an NPR article when we were talking about how bird watching was racist because most of the people who named these birds when they first, uh, you know, observed them in the wild over here in North America or whatever the hell it was, they had sorted past or they were slave owners or they, whatever the hell it is, it's just incredible where they put their slimy fingers into everything, these people. Uh, The bird names are racially problematic and others are alarmingly divisive. Justifying looting, how they'll justify looting, with claims that fears about crime are racist. And suggesting that Asian Americans who oppose affirmative action have been manipulated by white conservatives and not just by common sense and the innate drive for most healthy human beings to want to go out there and represent their own interests in a free marketplace and show people what you got going for you, you know? And by the way, Asians outpace white Europeans in things like uh, educational, uh, you know, environments, uh, things that affirmative action completely destroy the integrity of. Again, we're not dealing with people who have a full deck of cards. More recently, we've approached the Israel-Hamas war and its spillover onto the streets and campuses through the intersectional lens that has jumped from the faculty lounge to the newsrooms, oppressor versus oppressed. That That meant highlighting the suffering of Palestinians at almost every turn while downplaying the atrocities of October 7th or vice versa. You know, there are people out there like, uh, like, um, uh, I forget. Oh, we'll do that in a second. Let's see. For, for nearly all my career, working at NPR has been a source of great pride. It's a privilege to work in a newsroom at a crown jewel of American journalism. My colleagues are congenial and hardworking. I can't count the number of times I would meet someone. Blah, 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 blah. I love NPR. And he says at the end here, for years, um, whatchamacall, uh, even so, out of frustration, is that I won't speculate what's going on here. I don't want it to be to be uh, defunded. It doesn't matter declining ratings, sorry levels of trust in an audience that has become less and less diverse over time. The trajectory for NPR is not promising. And despite our missteps at NPR, defunding isn't the answer. Yes, it, it, it is. Funding you was never legal. <laughs> I tell you, can you do a little on that? Can you do a little bit on that? how it is not constitutional for you to get a single penny that originated from an American citizen, um, an American citizen's private labor. Can you, can you please do a little bit on that? And and even if you can find a way to just, I don't know, mine, uh, I, I don't know what the hell it is like under DC on, on federal constitutionally federal property, there is a giant gold mine that was discovered and suddenly the feds own had just made money of their own without leeching off of somebody else. There is still no place in the Constitution where you can have the federal government investing in a media outlet. It doesn't matter where the money comes from. But we live in a play-pretend environment. Completely play-pretend. Um, you know, and there's more, especially when, you, when I think about this going back to, I don't know, whatever the hell it is, there's so there's so much more on this when you think about what media used to be, and um, I think I just think about television. I think about a lot of things that we used to get back then, and that's just all what I'm observing all these years later. I never even lived through it. Uh, you know, when someone sits down, for example, um, with the Krasensteins, 
or that spaz destiny didn't even know him didn't even know about that weirdo with the typewriter jaw until um until the the, the zero hedge debate about january 6th whenever they sit down with the krasensteins or destiny the, the the days of phil donahue are over just getting down to what is has is complete control over npr the days of Phil Donahue are over, bringing on a young Ron Paul, uh, Mike Wallace sitting down and interviewing with Ayn Rand. You know, I, I watch all those interviews. I just want some perspective on it. That These controversial but enlightening dialectics that you, you uh, mostly baby boomers, and even those of you who were growing up in the 80s and the very early 90s watching talk shows back then, it was still around. It was still possible back then. It was still pretty damn interesting, you know? To watch these controversial but enlightening dialectics and debates that were going on that was being allowed on television, I was always shocked to see it. But uh, that's all gone. You know, uh, I just feel like the disagreements that are our... I mean, now what do we get? We get a... I think people have been trying to get Candace Owens and and Ben Shapiro to debate each other. Now we have to... Now we have different factions of this conservative alt media mainstream alt media that is debating each other over stupid shit it's just so tiring it's just so tiring so uh this is the reason why nobody's watching it all anymore and uh, and politics will always ha- be relevant especially when you're in election years and and you want to be able to uh rant and and make make some make some sense of the senseless but Boy, oh boy, uh, this is just, that's a backbreaker over there at NPR. Take away the money. I wish I could just turn it off. I wish I can turn it off. As far as being able to re- outreach, you know, do outreach and try to fix this problem and, and why we were talking about debates before just a couple of minutes ago, I just feel like the disagreements that we are having right now, they are on issues that are just so fundamental and primal in nature that it's better just to keep you to your own it's better just to keep like the 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 dancing shit libs that we were watching in the beginning the um the old people dancing around talking about social security and health care and all that stuff um that's ridiculous for sanity's sake you got to avoid those people you got to like I, I, I'll still they, they give me a uh, invite to their Christmas party. I'll still consider going show up with a bottle of wine, but I will not talk about any of this stuff. Well, what's the point? Because what we're discussing at the, the things that are all in debate, like don't bring up if you're a journalist, it is um, suggested that you don't use the term biological sex in your articles. When we start talking about that, avoiding just using, you're not even making a, there's not even a declaration being made. Don't use the phrase biological sex because the inference that there is some, that there is a objective truth, an objective, unchangeable biological truth that is embedded and encoded in each born human being and unborn human being is um is offensive and could be triggering avoid that when we start talking about things and we're on opposite sides of a fence that's i mean that is just fundamental I, it's better to keep to your own and just let the primal forces of nature sort everything else out because obviously a worldview a breakaway nation anybody it could be a household it can be a a town a country any nation that commits itself to mental gymnastics and com- in complete insanity that it takes to to suggest that biological sex as a term should be avoided just to keep all the inmates nice and happy. Um, that nation is not going to survive. The shelf life on that one is, is very, very short. So I just say, that's why I say, we know that the problems we have are just so obscene uh, and and fundamental at the same time, you're not going to you're not going to fix anybody who is bit by that snake. You know, you pray for them, and sometimes sometimes getting that close to the fires of hell can turn you around, and it could be a miraculous story. And then you have those survivors that come back and say, "Hey, I was in the middle of it." Many of you are in this audience, but 
this is you just got to be able to insulate yourself a little bit that doesn't not that doesn't mean ignore the world you know how what's going on you know what time of day it is keep that time of day and just just chill you got to just chill and keep the soul uh the soul intact because that's not gonna that's not gonna last nothing is good nothing is gonna last here's a cia officer and a former fbi agent kenneko the great put this out today who did this sound investigations i don't think it's james o'keefe let's see here cia officer and former fbi agent boasts about entrapping Americans, targeting Alex Jones, and 20 undercover FBI agents working at the Capitol on January 6th. He said, quote, you can kind of put anyone in jail if you know what to do. You set them up. We call it a nudge. This is seven minutes and 48 seconds. We'll watch a little bit of this on the other side because, you know, this is the other side of the coin with the media. Obviously, this is journalism. This is uh, investigative journalism that is, in my, my estimation, this is what anybody who is really invested in exposing abuses of power inside of a country that you really, really want to preserve for all time. That is what the press was supposed to be there for, to put pressure on institutions that, um, that have a lot of influence on our lives and need to be held in check. But once that that becomes an appendage of the system and it then becomes a way to actually fortify the system's scams and cons, the rackets that they run, the gangsterism, then of course you have NPR. Now uh, NPR covers for intelligence operations like what was going on with the Hunter Biden laptop story or anything else like that. They cover for it just by not talking about it. But perhaps NPR is really carrying the most water in the culture war and how to completely push farther along down the, the trail, how to degrade people's minds and and, uh, and 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 strip away all the standards that that you would hope that we'd have. So but still, this is something big. And just a reminder, too, because we know that entrapment is the name of the game. We know it. <laughs> we know it started that that was a. That all of our education on that started really getting ramped up in January of 2017 with Michael Flynn. This is crazy. Or or all throughout 2016 with the Crossfire Hurricane. Just incredible. Just incredible. But pay your taxes. It's uh it's April 9th. You have six six days to pay your taxes or file for an extension because the feds need your money. They have to keep working for us. Okay, they have to keep working for us. What would we do without them? Be something closer, much closer to paradise. I'll tell you that. That's what it would be. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back on the other side of the intermission. We've got this. We've got your calls. I've got an email from one of our members. You know, I saw this story about all of the military recruiting problems that we have. That there's a complete dip in the in the recruiting. And um, like we failed to meet some kind of a 40,000 recruit quota that the Air Force hit their quota. The Navy fell short. It's just it, it's just not working out very well. Well, I got an email from a, a one of our many members of the military out there right now that they had a little something to think uh, to, to add to this story. So I put it all together and that's going to be in the second half on top of some of your calls. We'll take this to the bottom of the hour, see how it all uh, shakes out. But please. Come on over to quitefrankly.tv, powered by Pilled Foxhole. The Pilled.net link, it's out there as well. I tweeted it out. I put it on Gab. I put it on, on Telegram, on Truth. Uh, it's under the description of the, of the YouTube and a few other things there. But uh, all else fails, quitefrankly.tv. It's powered by Foxhole. Just press play. There's no paywall, no nothing like that. And um, cast it to your television and relax, just like any other night. All right, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. That's not right. The rest of the show is available exclusively at pill.net. Follow the link in the description of the episode. Get signed up. It's that easy. Or head on over to quitefrankly.tv. Just press play. No paywalls, no censorship, no strings attached. So head on over, quitefrankly.tv, powered by Foxhole and pill.net.
It's intermission time, folks. Time out to press the like button. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to intermission. We'll, we'll be right back. Quite frankly. 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 Watch quite frankly and stuff. Quite frankly. Quite frankly. Quite frankly. Quite frankly. All my fellow Franciscans. Quite frankly. 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 We'll be in the gulag with you, Frank. Quite frankly. Quite frankly. Quite frankly. Quite frankly. Yo, what's good, Frank? Quite frankly. Quite frankly podcast. So everybody watch. Quite frankly.